Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I think we're gonna, we're gonna get started. Um, good day, and uh, my name is Guillaume Massonclair. I'm a senior economist at, at TIPS, and it's really my, my pleasure to, to welcome you uh, on behalf of TIPS, uh, Naledi, Groundwork, and, and Peter Wolpe uh, to, uh, to, this, uh, to this event, uh, to the, the virtual launch of uh, of our uh, documentary on the just transition in in South Africa's coal fields, um, really get that excited for for an event on on my end. I think uh, you know uh, we we launch a lot of a lot of reports. We do a lot of dialogues, uh, but certainly in our case, that's not every day. We uh, we, we launch a documentary and, and provide a, a platform for. For people on the ground to 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 express their their voices, um, so certainly very very excited uh, on my end. Um, we've already actually had a, a physical launch uh, of of this documentary in Mpumalanga uh, a couple of months ago in Steve Trete um, with about two hundred and fifty uh, uh, people. Uh, it was obviously very invigorating and great to be able to launch that documentary actually. Uh, with you know the, the people and the communities in Mpumalanga who are at the core of the just transition, uh, but it's also great to be able to bring that uh, to to a broader audience, and, and I think that's what you know we really want to to do that today, uh, and use that as as a way to start and further the discussion effectively. Uh, a few uh, you know. Uh, Housekeeping uh, items before we, we get started with, with our program. Um, you, you'll note that uh, we're hosting this as, as a meeting, so feel free to, to engage with one another in the chat or directly. Um, you know, we want to, to make sure this is as interactive as, as possible. Um, with that, though, comes a few, a few rules. Uh, please uh, you know, keep your, your camera off and your mic off if you're not, if you're not engaging. Uh, so as not to disrupt everyone else. Um, but um, besides that, you know, feel free, feel free to engage, of course, as much as possible uh, in, in the chat. Um, that that's great. Um, when we get to 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 the discussion, feel free to to raise your hand uh, or to make comments uh, in the chat, and we'll we'll take those, uh, of course. Uh, we, as I said, really really excited about about today's. Um, to this program, uh, uh, which is really centered around uh, around the documentary and the, the the voice of the people at the center of of South Africa's just transition, at least in the coal fields of of Mpumalanga. Uh, we have a really really simple program, and um, we'll hear uh, first from uh, from uh, the director of the documentary, uh, Joel uh, Chesley. We'll say a few words. Um, before uh, our, our, our keynote address uh, by uh, the um, group chief executive of, of ESCOM, uh, Andrew Derader. Um, and then upon that, we will uh, actually screen the documentary, which is about, uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, and you know, hope that you will, uh, will be able to enter that before entering uh, a bit of a panel discussion with uh, some colleagues from, uh, from Mpumalanga uh, from the province, um, from communities and civil society, from the unions and from the municipality. Uh, so quite, quite a, quite a, a good program for the next couple of hours. Uh, and of course, you know, we'll keep it as as interactive uh, as as possible. With that, without further ado, uh, let me let me hand over uh, to uh, to Joel. Uh, Joel, uh, together with uh, Chasselet, together with uh, Lloyd uh, Ross, uh, produced and directed the, the documentary, uh, and you know, have a, a long, a long career in in, in the field. Uh, and we're very, very fortunate to be able to work with them to to produce to produce that um, that documentary. We thought it quite quite opportune to uh, to give Joel uh, the opportunity to say a few words about. Um, about, I guess, the process and, and what it meant to her and, and to uh, and to, like, to work on that particular initiative um, to, to kick us off. So uh, Joel, uh, over to you. 
Um, thanks, Gelo. Um, yeah, uh, I was uh, very fortunate to have been asked to make this documentary by Peter Walpe, for whom I'd made a documentary, Lloyd Ross and myself had made a documentary about energy poverty in South Africa and also about her father, Harold Walpe. And so we, uh, I think Peter convinced Gaylor and um, Naledi and um, Groundwork that it might be useful to have something in the audiovisual field that would uh, try and convey the uh, the conundrum and the complexity of the situation in Pumalanga. When I first encountered the subject, it was just so challenging, intense, and um, I spent a lot of time researching and watching the webinars that had already taken place around the the issue and then we had a uh, I'm just telling a little bit about how it how it got made uh, we had a zoom with all the interested parties that's groundwork and tips and um, Peter and um, Naledi of course and uh, we decided that we would try and make it's only 30 minutes, what can you really convey in that short amount of time? We would try and get as many voices, as many stakeholders, as many people who are involved in the daily life of, you know, at the coalface and in the coal fields of our energy generation in the, of the, in the country. And so we were told to focus on two municipalities, that is, um, Emalachleni and Steve Thwete municipalities, because so much of the energy generation is concentrated in those two municipalities. Obviously, when we launched the film recently in situ, uh, we were asked, well, why didn't you come to Carolina and why didn't you go there? I mean, the, 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 the situation is, is extremely challenging to reduce to just two municipalities. Anyway, what we wanted to do was to, to plumb the voices from under the dark cloud. That's why it's called that, except that someone actually mentioned the dark cloud. And um, we interviewed as many people from the different layers of society, except the big guys and the big girls. So we, we, we followed um, the uh, tips and Naledi and uh, the, um, the people who commissioned the documentary to the work uh, to the workshops and the capacity building workshops that they that they organized and that is where we we collected the voices from the people directly affected by unemployment, bad air, contaminated water. Um, and then we also felt that the communities needed to understand the kind of challenges that the municipalities were facing. So we interviewed a section of the municipal, the people working in the municipalities who should have the power to, to impact their lives. And then obviously Mandy Rambaros from the Just Transition Office at ESCOM and various uh, stakeholders and revolutionary uh, environmentalists, and we try to give a, um, a sort of a prism through which to look at this um, intense situation and the trade unions, of course, and the unemployment, the people who are unemployed, and you'll see that um, th these different um, actors and um, impacted people all have some kind of a voice in this 30 minute film. Um, uh, I hear from Gaylor that he has been overwhelmed with people, people who have watched it and who have understood quite a bit of the situation that they hadn't understood before. So I'm very happy with that. I don't feel, I don't feel that this is an, uh, a sufficient um, exposition of the problem. But I think that it it probably does convey the complexity, the challenge, 
um, the catch-22, you know, of the situation in South Africa and probably on the planet in general, the challenge that is faced when one wants to alter the 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 the, the complex that generates electricity in and and energy in in a country. So I'm not expressing myself particularly well, but. Um, I think that the, it's best that you just watch the film. I must thank Lloyd Ross, who's the person who made the film with me, who um, filmed it, did the drone shots, edited it, and uh, you know uh, supported me in making this film. And um, tips, and especially because they 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 gave a lot of feedback, so that we could actually produce something that was. Um, that 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 fulfilled its uh, brief so i'm not going to take more of your time but thank you for watching and uh thanks thanks so much uh joelle i think that's you know that's really useful to i guess set the scene a little bit uh, in terms of where the, the kind of the documentary is located and and what's its purpose you know uh, of course it's not taking place within within a void um so yeah thank, thanks so much for that um it's it's now really my my pleasure to to welcome uh, someone who needs no no introduction um, uh, the, the the group uh, chief executive of of ESCOM and the director who, who has really been and, and is still is very much one of the architects of South Africa's just transition in the making uh, dealing with very much a difficult situation of course. Uh, in, in the country and in the utility, but really at the at the cool face, literally and and, uh, and and figuratively of South Africa's just transition, uh, you know, we often kind of differ to to ESCOM and and coal mining effectively as the two kind of key pillars for for South Africa's just transition in the coal fields, uh, and and really, um, I think uh, ESCOM has been you know. Uh, a pioneer in in that in that respect, uh, you know, with its own difficulty, but uh, showing really uh, what what can be done. Uh, so it's really really great, uh, and, and it's a great pleasure to to have uh, to have Andre with us today to share a few words uh, on on the just transition from from his perspective uh, and from mostly the, the perspective of of South Africa and, and the utility. Um, so uh, Andre. Uh, yeah, welcome once again, and uh, uh, over to you. Great, thanks very much for that uh, introduction, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me and giving me the opportunity to, to share a couple of thoughts on the uh, just energy transition as, as ESCOM sees it, and, and we realize that that's one particular paradigm, and there are, uh, as uh, Joel said, a number of different perspectives on this just energy transition that need to be incorporated and considered, uh, it certainly is not a simple matter to contemplate. So when, when ESCOM looks at uh, coal-fired generation, um, we, we look at a fleet of coal-fired power stations that are rapidly uh, approaching end of life. The average age of our plants, uh, excluding Madupi and Kusile, is now in the region of 43 years. Uh, the plants have been run very hard, they have been poorly maintained, and they uh, are in need of significant investment to become compliant with increasingly stringent minimum emission standards to the tune of some 300 billion um, rand, which of course ESCOM is a highly indebted utility, uh, simply does not have. So we've developed a strategy to bring forward um, the shutdown of some of our power stations that are simply becoming uneconomical to operate. We uh, plan to retire 11 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2030 and a further 11 gigawatts by 2035. So that's uh, about 47% of our total nameplate capacity that will be retired by 2035. Now, what this will do is quite interesting. It will reduce our CO2 emissions by a whopping 62%. So this initiative will make a major contribution 
to the decarbonization of the South African economy. However, electricity is still the lifeblood of any modern industrial economy. So we need to find a replacement for all of this capacity. And we've calculated that uh, because of the lower output that you typically get, the self-dispatching nature of renewable energy, that South Africa, and, and I'm using South Africa deliberately, not ESCOM, South Africa needs to uh, create about 50 to 60 gigawatts of new generation capacity over the same period of time, coupled with expansions to our storage capacity, to our transmission grid, some 8,000 kilometers, and also the strengthening and expansion of our distribution grid. The electricity supply industry requires about 1.2 trillion rand in new investment by 2035. So this is a, a really tall order that we need to uh, put forward. Now, what is inevitable is the transition. Uh, that is clear. Uh, the, the costs of renewable energy have come down very markedly. Um, we see a significant acceleration in the global trend towards decarbonization. Uh, of course, this has been held up by events in the Ukraine, but we, we certainly see this as an, in, an irreversible trend. And if we as an economy wish to maintain our global competitiveness and avoid the imposition of a carbon border tax as is contemplated by the European Union from 2023 onwards, we definitely need to accelerate our efforts to uh, decarbonize our electricity uh, industry very substantially. Now, the best wind and solar resources in the country are located in the southwestern part, in particular, the, north, uh, the northern Cape province. But this is very poorly served by a transmission grid. And we therefore have to expand our transmission grid by building 101 major new substations. And as I've said, build about 8,000 kilometers of new grid over the next decade. But because we don't have the luxury of time, we need to uh, create access to the grid uh, far sooner than that. And this is where there is a remarkable and very serendipitous confluence of circumstances in Pumalanga. Pumalanga, as is well known, is the energy hub of South Africa. That is where not only the electricity industry has its base, but also uh, the petrochemical industry. And therefore, we have this opportunity to leverage our existing transmission grid. Uh, as we shut down coal-fired power stations, we can increasingly use the grid capacity that is made available by providing access to renewable energy investments in the province. Now, this is a great enabler of the just energy transition because with respect to the Northern Cape, uh, there aren't too many unemployed coal miners wandering the streets of Uppington. So we wish to uh, attract and drive uh, investment in new uh, generation capacity, in particular renewable generation capacity, towards Mpumalanga, because that is where the biggest negative impact will be as a consequence of the energy transition. And this is critical if we want to make this inevitable transition a just one. People very glibly talk about the just energy transition, but very few people pay adequate attention to how to enable this transition to be just. Now, Bumalanga has three elements that, that make it a very attractive investment uh, destination. First of all, as I've said, it's got the grid. And the grid is, is a key enabler. It's, it's not a particularly uh, well understood part of the conundrum to decarbonize, but it is arguably the key enabler in order to accelerate uh, our transition to a lower carbon economy. And Mpumalanga has that existing infrastructure in place right now. And more of that will become available as we retire our coal-fired 
power stations. The second resource that Mpumalanga has is very substantial renewable energy resources. For a long time, the conventional wisdom was that Mpumalanga doesn't have sunshine and it doesn't have wind. And consequently, um, there was a lot of pressure from the IPP industry to expand the transmission grid to the Northern Cape, which we will still do. However, given the time pressure on us to uh, accelerate the introduction of grid access, Mpumalanga is a natural candidate to do exactly that. Recent studies have indicated that Mpumalanga is uh, blessed with very significant wind resources. Uh, we've uh, recently come into um, new data that, that uh, confirms this. And we are absolutely delighted that the, the wind industry is seizing on this opportunity. And we ourselves are looking at a 70 mega, megawatt wind farm in the uh, vicinity of our Kumati power station, which is going to be the first to be shut down permanently as of September of this year. Furthermore, the solar resources in Mpumalanga are some of the best in the world. While they are not quite as good as the Northern Cape, they are certainly far better than anything offered in Europe. And as you know, uh, even in uh, the very rainy and foggy Netherlands, uh, as well as the UK, we increasingly see solar panels on every roof. So again, Mpumalanga is um, well endowed with solar resources. The third element is arguably the most important element, and that is people, skills. Uh, people are very well trained in Pumalanga. Uh, they typically have had experience of working in industry, either mining or manufacturing. And there is a significant human capital base that is accessible and available uh, to be employed. And in fact, uh, recent studies done by the World Bank, as well as a study entitled the Co-Benefit Study, uh, indicate that between 160,000 to 300 net new jobs, with other words, after compensating for losses in the coal sector, will be created by the just energy transition. And, and this is certainly a, a very necessary and a very positive finding given that in Pumalanga is the province in South Africa with the highest youth unemployment. So a very important contributor to ensuring that we can also create a future for our young people. As ESCOM, we are therefore committed to driving this just energy transition through a process of repowering and repurposing our power plants. Uh, we're not even waiting for those power plants to be shut down permanently. But we're also enabling the private sector to step up their investment in Pumalanga by making available land that we own on a peppercorn rental basis, which will um, make it possible for private investors to access the grid using ESCOM land over a 20 or a 30 year lease period in order to uh, make sure that they can accelerate the um, establishment of their projects. We've engaged extensively with communities. Uh, when I recently visited Mpumalanga, it was made very clear to me by the executive mayor of Umulatleni. Uh, she made a very valid point. She said, um, nothing will be done without us. Uh, so we do need to take the community into account. We do need to consult. We do need to understand what the very legitimate concerns are that exists in the communities. We also need to play our part in cleaning up the environment. The, the coal mining and the coal value chain has, has uh, left some indelible scars on the landscape of Mpumalanga as any uh, drive through the area will very quickly confirm. And again, the repurposing of that land to renewable energy uh, offers a very elegant and uh, a just outcome to also uh, addressing some of the environmental damage done uh, in the process of, of coal mining. The final remark is uh, that we collectively need to address energy poverty. Uh, 
there is a lot of uh, negative publicity, some of it well-deserved, around uh, the emissions caused by the coal industry. And that is, and that is true, and, 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 and we need to own up to it. But one of the major causes of uh, the 7,000 premature deaths that we see as a result of ambient air pollution is energy poverty, where people burn coal for space heating, for cooking, because they are deprived of resources uh, to um, use cleaner forms of electricity. And addressing that, I believe, has to be a fundamental part of ensuring that the energy transition is, in fact, just. In closing, um, Pumalanga means uh, the land of the rising sun. And I believe that we are witnessing a new dawn for the province as um, the second chapter in its um, history as the energy hub of South Africa. Um, I want to congratulate uh, Joel and Lloyd Antops for the, the video that was made. I, I've uh, had the opportunity of watching it. And it's, uh, um, I must say, I, I, was, I was quite envious. This is the video that ESCOM probably should have made. So you've, uh, you've done a fantastic job. It is, it is really, um, it, it, it really captures all of the complexities and uh, made me sit and think very long and hard about what the just energy transition means. So I think from that perspective, you've definitely achieved your objective and hopefully you will catalyze a very rich and productive debate. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Andre, and, and thanks, thank you for, for the good word. Um, uh, it's, it's really much appreciated. Um, and I think, what I what I liked uh, with you know your words is that you you know you're not shying away from 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 I guess the challenges, but putting a lot of emphasis as well on the assets that Mpumalanga has, and I think we we not often enough focus on the fact that Mpumalanga has has a lot of assets uh, to 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 build upon, and, and then we can leverage those um, for for the future. And I think you know uh, we we not engaging enough with the assets as we think about, I guess, a new economic development strategy or an economic rejuvenation strategy for, for, for the coal fields. And I think that's really important, um, you know, while we focus, of course, on some of the challenges that we uh, accept as well that they are uh, you know, great assets in the province that can be, that can be leveraged. We know at, uh, at, at a point in our, in our program where we, we want to uh, spend a bit of time uh, for you to to see the documentary, uh, and 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 hopefully it will you know uh, speak to you as much as it has spoken to the people who already already watched it. Um, before we we do that, I uh, want to take the opportunity to to really thank again uh, uh, the project team uh, from from Tips, from the lady, from Groundwork, uh, and, and Peter. The production team was with Joel and Lloyd and our funders, of course, uh, the UK Pact program, as well as the uh, European Union through the Green Economy Coalition, um, and all the people that made this documentary possible, the people who are in the documentary and that took their time to share uh, their thoughts and, and you know, provide their voices to, to this documentary. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without without all, all those people and all institutions. So once again, thank you. Um, we're now going to, to show the documentary. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, roll. Mpumalanga has 12 power stations, and most of the coal mines in the country are also in Mpumalanga. If you drive on the highways between Pretoria and Middleburg, you can at any stage see at least three power stations. When you're entering Whitbank, you can see there's a dark cloud. 
Mostly it's from the power plants. Secondly, it's from the blasting that takes place. Take coal out of South Africa and our economy implodes. One of the key challenges is the bulk of the coal economy decades, century of economic development based on coal is concentrated in two municipalities. That provides an opportunity for action because we know where to act, but that also provides a crucial challenge. Most of the towns developed because of the mines and because of the power stations. You get rid of the mines, you get rid of the power stations, you kill towns. Go town straight, even here at Pulling Soap. Maybe in 20 years it will be a ghost town. And the majority of people in this province will be without jobs. Because the entirety of the economy of those municipalities is dependent on coal. This move away from coal, it's a positive thing. What am I lying? You're wrong. Coal is food. Coal is life especially in Pumalanga, in Malathe. It's life. It's all I know. So without the cold, there's no jobs. My lungs are getting blocked because of the dust. A hidden killer. A life full of sickness. It's not life. And the worst part is that the mines are taking the water from the people. Because that water is contaminated. It's years we have been talking about this thing. But we are not being listened. We sound as if we want to make people choose between your health and earning an income. So it's a double-edged sword. It's life and death. I've been reading the news this morning and then they say ESCOM is like the biggest sulfur polluter in the world. This is where it all happens. That's where Unit 1 was. Unit 2, 3, 4, so it continues and this is the only remaining unit, Unit 9. These things that were designed for 50 years, extended to 60 years. We're shutting them down. We are doing away with coal. This is emissions. This is really what the environment does not need. This is the global warming source. The season itself now is gone haywire. You get winter rain, you get cold in summer, so ish. Within a very short space of time from nowhere, the weather changes. My daughter was saying to me the other day, you know, this summer is a scam. I have never seen such a summer. It is a scam because most of the time it's summer, but it's so cold. If, if you connect all the stories, it, it becomes easy for you to link with what is happening. If we are a country that prioritizes the interests of the poor and the vulnerable, then we need to act with greater urgency to respond to the effects of climate change and make our contribution in preventing it. The message of the president, it's a clear direction. So what one can say in a nutshell, we accept that report. It's us as local municipalities that must see to it that it get implemented. We have ratified the Paris Agreement to combat climate change as part of the global effort to dramatically reduce the rate of global warming. If you look at the IPCC report, and you know the Paris Agreement talks about trying to limit the warming of the globe to 1.5 degrees, but you have to multiply it by two to look at the impacts in southern Africa. So from a South African perspective, we are very vulnerable, not only to the changes in the climate, but also to our trade partners transitioning as well. And if everything from South Africa will be boycotted, if we don't comply, then we are dead. Especially the downtrodden, 
where are they in all these things that are happening right in front of our eyes? Well, climate change has not just an environmental issue. It's never been, right? It's, it's a social issue. It's a political issue. So with all of those um, elements coalescing, it's, it's very, very clear that we absolutely, that the just transition is a, is a non-negotiable for the country. The debate is not to transition to a low-carbon economy or not. That's not the debate here. We have to transition, else we have a big, big problem. We are in trouble as a species, you know, as society. The question is, do we transition in a just or in an unjust way? As we stand, there's no agreement on what we mean by just transition. There is a real reason for us to move from where we are to a just transition, we understand that. But I'm from the trade unions, wherever I am, I will resist when it comes to job process. I will say no. We are unemployed here. A lot of people they are unemployed. And if you can see this, Henry Power is optimum. If optimum can be open and Henry Power can function, as it was before. We won't see anyone here. We'll be at work, everyone will be at work. We don't want to see another Hendrina. You cannot close coal-fired power stations and close the mines and think that it's okay. And then go internationally and say, oh, well, we've reduced our carbon footprint by X amount. Our bread is buttered by this coal. That is why we've got that fear. Unions and business have to work together, otherwise we all lose. We're talking about 150,000 direct jobs and an estimated 650,000 indirect jobs. We're going to be looking at new ways of keeping business going but supporting greener technologies while we transition out of supporting our existing mines and power stations. And some people understand that as just transition. Others, more ambitious, see it as a platform to transform society. We see it as better health services, better transport. We see it as a basic income grant. Just transition is about us changing the way we live, our lifestyles. It is about us reducing the high rate of consumerism. There won't be just transition without uh, sustainable development. Once we get to a cleaner energy, the environment will obviously improve. Biodiversity will improve. Water quality will improve, air quality will improve. So that's why I'm saying it needs to be just, not only just for the communities or for humans, but it also needs to be just for the environment. We would miss a massive opportunity if we don't pursue that transformative agenda. That means participatory justice, making sure that the process itself is inclusive. And then it's about distributive justice. Whoever loses their job, loses their livelihood as the result of the transition, should have an alternative. And it is also about restorative justice. Can we improve access to services? Can we improve the direct environment of people in terms of air, water, land? Can we have a better economy for all? You know, can we address those historical inequalities? Just transition for me, it's a paradigm shift. Often people ask me, what's the most difficult thing you think with the just energy transition? It's not technology, it's mindsets. Having people's mindsets change is, is the most difficult part, I think. We are in Emalatleni, right at the heart of coal mining, in an area called Siangoba, where about 12,000 family units have just been built for the unemployed people most of them ex-mine workers, and some of them never even got any form of employment in their lives. So we launched this agroecology initiative as part of our just transition. We are doing our best to foster a paradigm shift. At the moment, the participants, um, as they are training here, are beginning to enjoy this. I like planting, I like nature. <laughs> Gradually, they are regaining that love for the soil. As black people, Nje, we are happy because when we grow up, we're knowing that white people are the, those who are having the farms. 
Now I see many people are inspired. Let's tell the truth. The land is the life in the soil. Life isn't there without clean water and the clean air. Life isn't there without the food that we are producing. So that's all what we are trying to do in order to make our contribution towards the reduction of climate change, moving society away from the current destructive economic activities which are not sustainable. <laughs> The minds are moving in the center of the community. They're blasting each and every day. The landowner, municipality, they got the permit to rehabilitate. While they are mining, blasting, they are claiming that they are rehabilitating. The municipality gave them the permission. Unfortunately, we find local governments sandwiched in, in a position where and they understand what the issues are on the ground, but they're unable to influence all of them because these decisions get made at national level departments. We had a huge complaint with a city and water was overflowing through Olifant's River. So I tried by all means to get DMR, but I got coffee. We have tried and tried you know, to get DMR to sit with us so that we can talk about these issues, so that we can find solutions around these issues, but all in vain. We don't have those powers. They told us, Nina, who are you, Nina? We don't get permission from you. We get permission from DMR. We are talking about the just transition, but why are still these licenses being given out? If we are serious about moving from coal to clean energy, as organs of state, we need to talk in one voice. When the president speaks, the minister should not contradict him. Somehow, somehow there is a contradiction on what we are saying, what we are planning to do on the other hand. DMR is giving licenses like nobody's business. Then we ask ourselves, are we really serious? Are we moving together or what? It's still business as usual. I will tell you, in Emalatheni, I don't see any. There are new minds emerging every day. So it tells you that the licenses are still being issued out. Actually, it is government that is confusing the private sector and our community. Hence, they are not going to buy in into our concept very easy. I don't know whether they are trying to fool us or they are trying to cover up. All we can do is to talk to province, province must talk to national, and then that's where it becomes complicated. So I need that cooperative governance framework to be fully implemented, all organs of state talking to one another to achieve the same goal, which is to serve the community. We are the servants of the community. So that's where I think the central government is lacking because they are not really telling us how are we going to do it. Now I'm speaking like a, 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 as an employee of local government, how are we going to do it? It is not clear how it's going to be done. The state must create an environment in which the private sector can invest and unleash the dynamism of our economy. So I think corporations, you know, some of them willingly, but some of them are being forced by their shareholders and the investors to change that mindset. But equally, it is also an environment in which South Africans can live a better life and unleash the energy of their capabilities. When you talk to investors now, they're no longer looking at what is your bottom line profit. They're also looking at how, what are you doing about the environment? How are you protecting uh, social growth and social welfare? No one must be left behind. Most big companies have what they call a CSI budget, which they have to spend. And that has to be spent on the communities that are around the mines. Capital is mobile. They just destroy and migrate. We need to look at how much are these companies giving vis-a-vis -vis the environmental liability that we are inheriting as communities. We pay the heavy price. It's always going to come down to also profits. You want to make a living and you want to do well. You want to keep people employed. But these companies are hiding behind the corporate social responsibility or the SLPs. They are not addressing that which is, which is actually essential for us, the transformation of our society.
to a better one. I think if mining companies were more ethical and more caring, I think most companies could do a lot more. If I can mention one Ward 7, there's a mining house out there. They do almost everything for that community out there. From the infrastructure in building a clinic, a hall, some houses, and all that, they do it in partnership with our local economic development desk. They don't just come into a community and say that we've got this, we don't mind about the municipality or government, this is our money. No, they follow two processes. That's my FUBE code. I'm very lucky to work for companies that are committed to ensure that we implement the commitments that we have made throughout our permits. Across the millefield, that's our discard dam. There will usually be acid drainage. The aim of the project is what to do with the water that remains after mine closure. So what we are looking at is to have the water from the mine and you can use that for farming purposes instead of for 50 years trying to treat water, which is most costly when you compare to this exercise. So the water that is actually a liability for the mines is now becoming a great asset. The other mines are interested. A number of people were contacting us to understand the key issues that we are looking at, especially in terms of the water qualities and how do we identify an area where we can do such farming projects. So corporate social responsibility, yes, we will welcome it to intervene, but it must not intervene to maintain the status quo. And we have to change the way that we think um, and our expectations, um, because I mean, we all grew up thinking, you know, you have to make a lot of money to be successful. And I think that whole paradigm has to shift. Um, and that you actually, the whole respect for, for different cultures, different communities and nature has to actually be taught at school. In order for us to make meaningful shift, we, we need workers and community people to be involved. They, they haven't been included in decision making. I mean, if somebody knew that living in this area would impact negatively on his or her health, I don't think they would have taken such a decision. I mean, they would have demanded a better place to live in. There's a need for more education, more awareness, raising around climate change, um, why there's this need to move away from coal. We're here running capacity building workshop. The ultimate idea is to take what we hear on the ground and feed it back into national level policies where the big decisions happen. Because the way the politics works in South Africa, the decisions on how things happen, happen from on top. We need actions and I feel as if us as the community in Pumalanga, we are not doing enough. The transition is happening and we're still trying to fight and find more jobs in coal. So by the time we look this side, they would have set it up according to their plans, not according to what we need. Because now we are talking of a just transition, a fair change. What will be fair if we are not involved as communities? Because at the end of the day, those policies bind us. We haven't had a community engagement strategy as a province. I think we, we've been reactionary in our action. So it becomes very important that we bring those community structures in as early as the planning phase of any development that will take place within a certain community. There's a lot happening in this space. The Mpumalanga province are actually developing a just transition framework. It's the first in the country will link with PCC work and the work happening at the municipal level and deal with some of the issues that you have raised today around managing health, education and bringing in national government more strongly. So building those alliances and working together because there's common issues amongst the various stakeholders and they've just been talking at each other instead of to each other and coming up with collective solutions. Everybody needs to start sitting around the same table and actually presenting what their plans are because at the moment everything is happening in silos and everybody is doing their small little projects on their own and it's costing a lot of money and it's not sustainable because it's too small. The Green Cluster is the structure that is going to coordinate all activities around your green economy, bringing together all the stakeholders that are operating in the province. 
the cluster. It's conceptualized on the basis of a triple helix model. It will bring in government, business, and academia is working with us. One of our biggest problems is to move this from a totally unwanted concept into something where now Department of Water Affairs is highly interested. Two years ago they called this one of their flagship research projects. The crop is standing beautifully. I think the harvest will be really good this year. Mining happens all over the world. So if we can actually skill the community in how to rehabilitate the soil and the water, we can actually start an agricultural value chain. It's really growing nice. With passive water treatment, you revitalize wetlands. And as soon as you've got wetlands re-established, birds will come back and animals will come back. Then you can maybe look at tourism. We can move away from the coal, but what are you going to replace it with for us? Before they bring something, they must bring skill first. They can't just bring something and say, no, we need artisans like this and this and this without any trainings. Over the next 10 years, 10 billion is going to be spent in the province of Mpumalang on your just transition. I don't have an idea of solar. I know that solar is for electricity and stuff and needs sun. Then after that, when solar is there, who's going to maintain it? Maybe if they can train us for that. People are losing jobs. Uh, so we want to reskill these people and prepare them. We need to start creating those jobs to show that, yes, there are some alternatives. This could be in energy, this could be in manufacturing, in agriculture, in tourism. The best thing is to focus on alternatives, because these alternatives are the ones that are going to actually deliver us the future. And until we create those new jobs, whoever is set to lose, is going to resist the transition. We are a developing state. Could it be that we want to measure ourselves with the developed world now? It's because we know better now. If I can use an analogy, we leapfrogged in Africa from landlines to mobile telephony. If you look at how that just took off on the continent, you know, everybody could have a phone. We did not say, well, no, let's just try this landline thing first, since everybody else did it, and then move to mobile technologies because we recognize this was something better. So if we can use that analogy to explain the electricity, we recognize that there is something better now. So engage us, call us in all the engagement, so that we understand the train, where the train is going, so that we don't miss the point, or we do all this work, then at the end of the day we find the resistance. This is where we are headed. The intended projects will take another while being developed, but we have put up these demonstration ones. It's very good for ourselves, our employees and the community so they can start smelling what is coming in here. The community is very excited about the, the repowering and repurposing program. Because, you know, in the past when ESCOM shut down plants, it literally was a shutdown and then the land was sold and, and you moved out of the areas. But because we already have an infrastructure, and critically because of the people that have come to depend on Komati, it would have been very inhuman for a business which is owned by a government to just shut and disappear. We are here to experience what ESCOM is now trying to transform into. Now we want to see this happening in our municipality. Hence, we show an interest out here. There's a wonderful microgrid pilot project we have in Fixburg in the Free State where we have 25 homes connected up to a solar microgrid plant. We test Next Horizon technologies. So the rural microgrid in Fisberg has demonstrated that the reliability of these plants have now proven themselves. That transition to a greener future is something that we are busy with. Projects such as this microgrid ticks all those boxes in terms of social upliftment, supplier development, localization, upliftment of communities. The model of Fixburg is very interesting because we have what we call community ownership of the plant. Uh, it's 25 homes, all women-headed households. I cook with my lettuce, I light my lettuce inside. I've got hot water, I wash with them every morning. The other thing about this community was 2017 when their plant went live was the first time they had electricity. Ah, oh, my life. Ooh, well, so difficult before. No. And now we've reduced this plant to this containerized option. 
This is an equivalent of that panel down in fixed pack. It's in commission as it stands. You can actually pack those panels into the container and transport it anywhere in the country. And then you set down the container in the area where you want to get electrification going and you can connect up that community. It's as simple as I'm saying it. At Komati, we are shutting down. The workers that are there, what are they going to do once the station shuts down? We will be able to assemble these here at Komati for distribution to wherever they are required. If that's proven, we copy it at Hendrina, we do it at all the other stations that are here marked to be shut down. If any organization come to us as communities, we must discuss the solutions. We know all of us the problems. We don't need to discuss the problems anymore. Stop, stop the talk shops and actually just, um, we're going to make lots of mistakes, but if we don't get the spade in the ground, uh, we don't know what the mistakes is that we need to learn from. So I really, we're really pushing on getting in there, working with the communities and starting these projects, because we've been talking for long enough now. <laughs> South Africa has the tools to achieve a just transition on all fronts. The democratic process in the pre-94 and immediate democratic era was very vibrant. Grassroots mobilization, the emergence of the constitution, many of those dynamics were really inclusive. That provides the opportunity to rekindle really that process. And then if you look at it in terms of creating better society, better livelihood, all the policy tools that are required to do that are known and have been used to some extent to achieve a great deal of progress actually since 1994. The question is can we re-harness the potential effectively of those tools to have a just transition going forward? We know what needs to be done. The question is, you know, do we have the political will to do it? And are the interests of all aligned? I was born on the day they landed on the moon and that was actually the first time where they took a picture of Earth and actually realized this is the finite, this is all we have. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about that, because in the 1970s there was a definite realisation, for the first time ever, that we really need to look after our only home. The natural environment works as a system. If the air is affected, the water component at some stage will be affected. The biodiversity component will be affected. And all these are the basic components where we derive our livelihood. So we should not neglect one component of the environment and say, let it be so because it's not affecting me at this stage. What we are not aware of is that at the end of the day, there won't be any jobs in a dead planet. The environment has no boundary. So we need to watch that space and make sure that whatever we do is for the betterment of our community. Thank you. Here we go. Um, hope you uh, enjoy that. Um, it'd be great if you know you could, uh, I guess, pop your pop your thoughts or you know things that spark to mind. Um, you know, you can do that in the chat, um, or you know, feel free to raise your hand as well. We'll uh, we'll we'll take some. Uh, some interventions um, in, in the panel as well. Um, I see some, some people are already raising their hands, so uh, that's that's great. Um, yeah, feel free to just you know I think pop up, pop your thought into into the chat. Uh, what does uh, come to mind? You know when you when you when you watch the, the documentary, um, and you know you can do that. Take a moment to think about it uh, while we. Um, while well, we bring our, our, our panel, uh, our panel forward. So I just wanna uh, ask our, our, our panelists to uh, to just maybe please um, come come to the to the fore. Um, we'll uh, give 
each each of our panelists about uh, five six minutes to to make uh, introductory uh, uh, remarks uh, really uh, just to to hear their thoughts and and reflect on the documentary but also of course the work that they are doing um we uh will start um with uh Sebia. um Dudu is the Provincial Climate Change Coordinator at the uh, Mpumalanga Province uh, within the Department of uh, Agriculture, Rural Development, Land and Environmental Affairs. So he's been really a great champion of just transition uh, in, in the province, uh, spiriting uh, the development of uh, a just transition strategy in the province, as well as many other, uh, many other processes. Um, it was really great to um, to hear uh, from from Dudu uh, uh, um, about her thoughts on on this. Um, Dudu, if you can uh, put your camera uh, uh, over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I could I could see that um, the attendance is very good. You have done a very good job. Um, uh, especially in mobilizing the communities uh, to be part of this. But uh, at a provincial level, we really appreciate this kind of initiatives. Because what we have noticed that um, as government, we cannot just like eat this like uh, elephant alone. We have to slice it into pieces. And some each and every sector has to carry some responsibilities on it. As uh, my colleagues that have talked, even in the documentary, that uh, this is a reality that we have now in Bubalaga. There's a cold phase out, and it's already started and at a different stages, though. And at the same time, we can't stop it is happening. Uh, now we have to look into future to say what is it that we really need to promote and to consider in implementing to reduce the or to push in the jobs that are going to be lost. At the same time, it is Gumalanga's reality that we are housing a lot of power stations. And at the same time, if you check um, in terms of, uh, we are accounting most of the considerable share of South Africa's uh, emissions from coal, and we are highly dependent on um, coal economically, if you check basically. And at the same time, 50% of South Africa's emission is coming from Bumala. So this is a great opportunity even for us. If you check, I think most of the colleagues have highlighted that 85% of the coal used locally is coming from Bumala. And at the same time, 30% it's, it's been exported. So you could tell the number of jobs that are going to be lost in, in coming with that. So meaning that we have to think above and beyond um, what uh, we have planned and what we are coming up with. I think we really need to come together, all of us, because it's not only that, that is the reality for Bumalang. Significantly, we have a lot of risks. We have air pollution, water and land. Uh, these are the issues that we are dealing with on a daily basis that has impacted negatively on the health of the people and at the same time on the food uh, security and mm -hmm. By saying that there's a lot of biodiversity loss that is taking place. And if you check basically, we are kind of committed as Mpumalanga, but we realize that uh, to reduce the emissions, but we realize that we cannot do it as uh, Mpumalanga alone. We really need a lot of social partners to come together and to ensure that we are aligned with international and national frameworks that have already been developed and committed themselves in. As Mpumalanga, when we are checking basically, nationally is clear when it comes to just transition, what is it that they have to do? And at the same time, uh, at a provincial level, we are still grappling with it. But when you check at a local level, to be honest, uh, there's nothing that is happening. Because more than anything, um, local government at the moment is at higher risk. It's a risk group, actually. Because most of the issues that we are talking about, it needs to be implemented and be mainstreamed in their plan that they are developing. So somewhere, somehow, we have to look above and beyond to say, at a local level, because more than at, at the same time, the local municipalities are responsible for or are accountable for the communities that they have to drive themselves in. 
in ensuring that they are rendering effective services, but they have to ensure that the public performance sector of the municipalities are at a right core to be able to do so. So somewhere, somehow, I think the democratic governance, that kind of a framework as in Malanga, we really need to emphasize. I think most of the colleagues have talked about in the document to say, yes, there's a lot of talk that is going on. There's a lot of development of policies that are going on. But I think somewhere, somehow, we really need to find a real sort of like a stable way to come together to say, how are we going to take this forth? And as Mpumalanga in totality, you'll be negatively uh, impacted by the just transition. I hear most of the colleagues, there are a lot of initiatives that are being made on the just transition, but basically now we have to check to say, those initiatives, how many jobs are they gonna be cautioned? Are we taking in all the other sectors and associated sectors that will be affected on that? Or are we only looking at the energy transition? But or we are looking at economically diversifying or in, in incorporating all the other sectors that are used to be there. But more than anything, I think it's the governance that needs to happen in Gumala. There's a lot of uh, activities that are going on. And at the same time, it's what we highlighted on the just transition phase one plan to say, really, really, the governance is the key now from Gumala. So if we can bring all these um, initiatives and interventions that are happening to drive just transition, and then after that, from there, we see how much are we gonna be covered, what is left, so that the plan, it will be talking to each and every one, not each and every person came up with a single plan. So on that, uh, I think in the uh, state of the province, we requested the uh, premier to declare that we have to develop the just transition and climate change working group that should be championed at the premier's office. So all now the community, the municipalities, the NGOs, the academia, all the sectors that are, they need to be now coming, bringing in the solution to this. So this is what we really, really want to do as Mpumalang. And we realize that in all these things, we have to be socially progressive and at the same time, environmental protection, uh, protecting the environment. And at the same time, economically, we have to be successful as Mpumalang. We can't fail. Our, all the world is looking at us to say, how are you going to transit in a just way and in a fair way as Mpumalang? But if you check basically, as we are talking all of us here, if one fails, it means everybody fails. Meaning that we have to speed up this working group so that everybody comes together and after they share whatever information they have. There's a lot of information that is already happening in Pumana, but it's not well coordinated and there's a misalignment of policies that we have. Because like we are not considering all the other key elements that is happening. I hope I've covered the six minutes that you've given me. <laughs> I was trying to just like summarize it uh, on commenting on that one. Yeah, thanks so much, Jude. I think that was great you know, in terms of an overview of, of what's going on in the province. And you know, it's really great to hear again about some of those initiatives around the plans, the strategy, you know, climate change working group that's uh, that's that's being established, you know, and really, you know, uh, and Pumalanga being you know, at, at the forefront of that, um, not just in the country, of course, but by by many respects, you know, uh, on a global level, uh, really being one of the pioneers um, comes with, with, of course, challenges, um, but also with opportunities. Um, <clears throat> I want to now introduce our, our second second panelist, um, uh, Matthew uh, Schlaverny, uh, who you've seen in the documentary. Uh, he is uh, the coordinator of the Southern Africa uh, Green Revolutionary Council in, in Malashleni. Uh, he's uh, you know, worked with mining affected communities uh, for a very long time, and you've seen it in, in, in the documentary, trying to really uh, implement the paradigm shift that he's, that he's talking about, really, in, in, in shifting the needle on the ground. Um, so, uh, Matthews, uh, great to, to, to have you with us. Um, over to you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon to all of you colleagues. It is indeed appreciable and a pleasure for me to share my insights and possibly my experience. 
Um, I must also indicate that I'm also the national organizer of the right to say no, which is cutting across, um, you know, uh, South Africa and Southern Africa. Uh, very important, of course, is to, is to raise the fact that um, indeed, there are no jobs in a dead planet. And um, in order for us to actually avoid reaching that point, it is important for us uh, to start dating our hands and putting our focus on alternatives. Alternatives that will actually ensure the paradigm shift that we're talking about. Because um, the reality is that in the Mpumalanga High Felt, in particular Emalasheni, the growing number of unemployed people are coming with uh, a certain uh, high levels of violence, including GPV, because of hunger, uh, poverty, and, and the depression that comes with unemployment. So how do we then uh, go about um, is for us to invest our energy and resources in championing these alternatives. So from our part, we, we, we realize the extent of the damage uh, to our water sources, which is uh, continuous because we see these mining companies uh, mushrooming. And in fact, we always say to people, they are applying what we call guerrilla tactic. Because the moment you are looking at this side, they are that side. The moment you are looking that side, there's another blasting taking place. There's another, you know, destruction of your water table and the wetlands carrying on. And the soil that we're supposed to actually rely on continues to be contaminated. So um, as part of our contribution, we said, yes, it is important as activists, as community activists, uh, to talk and preach and, and, and do a lot of, you know, what you call advocacy about, you know, the future. But if we don't date our hands, that is not going to be helpful. And it's not like going to provide any solutions. It's not like going to act as a solution to our people. So with those, I'm saying that it is important that we view uh, this transition not only as something that is confined to technologies, uh, but it is something that has to do with the total, you know, uh, transformation of society, paradigm shift. We need to, 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 to change the way in which we do things, our lifetimes. So um, we started with an initiative to roll out the agroecology initiative in Emalatlene, right at the center of coal mining. And as you saw in the video, we are located closer to the 12,000 units uh, which are predominantly occupied by unemployed people and who are very far from town. So who have to travel just to buy a bag of, of you know, uh, um, tomatoes, cabbage, or a bag of, you know, millimi. So how do you actually uh, uh, come in and intervene in that space is to come up with an initiative such as this one that will actually not only you know, uh, 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 provide um, uh, 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 like um, uh, work opportunities for the people, but equip them with the technical skills uh, that are required to actually do, you know, uh, 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 produ food production and also be able to replicate this in the various areas of this community. But it also goes a long way towards supporting food sovereignty. Because these people here are actually, the, the people that are, are, are residing next to this project are consuming food that most of them are actually participating in the production. And the, 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 the food that they consume is organically grown, it's not out of pesticides. We are not using tractors here uh, that are contributing to carbon emissions. We are not transporting the food uh, to far distances. They just walk in to buy uh, the vegetables here. So this is the kind of a shift to say, we need to consume that which is produced locally, but at the same time, ensure that our people are participating. And this is where then just transition 
comes from below. Because if it comes from above, if it comes from the government officials, if it comes from you know us in the privileged NGO world, we can only talk about it, and it is nice. It, it, it sounds very great, you know, to talk about just transition. But does it really change the lives of the, of the ordinary people on the ground? Not unless we do something, not unless we dirty our hands, not unless we come up with alternatives that will actually result in community-driven project to rehabilitate the soil, to rehabilitate, you know, to reclaim the water, uh, uh, to bring about recreation in our rivers and to reduce the impact of uh, all the, the, the goods that we actually uh, rely on. So rolling back the dependency is quite key. So with those, I just want to say thanks and thanks for the opportunity. And it is a struggle going forward. Um, yes, there are no jobs in a dead planet. And development does not mean that you must actually ex you know, expel people from the land. It does not mean that you must continue to contaminate water. It does not mean that you must continue to emit emissions that are killing uh, the ordinary uh, uh, citizens of the country. It does not mean that you must actually externalize the cost to the ordinary people. It is painful. We are paying with our lives. We are dying every day. And it is us who must actually pay for that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matthews, for I think uh, a very powerful call to action. And uh, and I think you know, walking uh, walking the talk uh, with with the initiatives that you're developing in in, in the Malasheni and in the province, um, and I think you know, really being quite explicit about the scale of the challenge, but also again, I think the scale of the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> And now I want to, to, to introduce our, our, our next uh, panelist, um, Rita uh, Nglovu, um, who is a researcher at the National Union of Men Workers. Um, and she represents the union in, in climate change as well as just transition debates. She's been in that, in that space uh, for, for quite some time, working with, with uh, as Naledi and Kusatu and, and also at Nedlac. Um, so, been embedded in in those debates from uh, a trade trade union perspective uh, and really great again to to have uh, you with us rita um, over to you uh thank you chairperson for this opportunity and good afternoon to everyone we welcome the documentary and the inputs that have been made by previous speakers um and as a union as the national union of Union of Mine Workers, we recognize that the transition is already underway and that it is unstoppable. Given the past economic changes, the working class and the marginalized groups in society were always the ones to bear the brunt of such changes. As a result, we are of the opinion that the transition should be a just transition and it should be inclusive of the working class and the communities. The working class must be part of the decision-making bodies as we transition. Recognizing the current state of the economy we are faced with right now in South Africa, where the economy is stagnant, uh, we have 35% unemployment, rising inequality and growing poverty. We feel that it is important that South Africa carefully reconsider the goal of net zero utility transition by 2015 and transition cautiously. We're not saying we shouldn't transition, but we should be cautious as we transition to ensure that we are not leaving anyone behind. And this will also help to avoid the worsening of our development indicators. As a result, we feel that um, we need to apply both adapt adaptation and mitigation strategies. It is clear that from the changing weather patterns, we need to prepare and adjust for the current effects of climate change and predict for future impacts. As we mitigate, we must also consider all prospects, including clean energy technologies. This will help the country to maintain employment in the coal sector while utilizing the resources available in the country. In addition, programs must be put in place for the retraining, reskilling, redeployment, and the natural attrition of workers. We recognize the impact that the closure of Andrina had on communities and employment 
As a result, we suggest that programs such as the one at Mafube should be replicated by other mines where the working class can be trained in rehabilitating the soil and water in order to create jobs. In addition, grassroots initiatives like the one Matthews, my fellow panelist is involved in, should be encouraged. This will help to minimize the devastation of job losses and ghost towns, among others, caused by the closure of a major source of income in a community. As a working class, we welcome the fact that Mbumalanga uh, sorry, Mbumalanga will continue to be the main producer of electricity for the country. As a result, we need to know the specific skills that will be needed as we transition from coal to other sources of power in order to prepare ourselves as workers. Since ESCOM is still going to be the major energy generator, ESCOM must provide skills that will be needed going forward. We are also interested to know the nature of skills and the number of workers that are involved in the repurposing of Gomati power station and other power stations that will be repurposed. Realizing the effects of coal powered stations, the health and safety of workers and community members must be in the forefront as mines and power stations are decommissioned. Medical care must be provided at all times for those who are affected. And, and most importantly, the working class community members must become watchdogs for their communities. They must be vigilant about projects that take place in other communities to ensure that they are of the best interest for them, as it is common for projects to be implemented without community consultation, as we also witnessed in the documentary way, uh, things continue to take place without the consultation of the communities. Uh, thank you very much, Gela. Thanks so much, uh, Rita, for, the, for those points. Uh, again, very much on point, I think, in terms of, you know, the scale of the challenges and, and, and of the opportunities uh, going forward. Um, I know our, 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 our fourth panelist at, at challenges, uh, and I don't, don't see uh, Nankululeko in, uh, in the list uh, of, of participants. Um, uh, Nankululeko uh, is uh, at the Emalashini municipality, um, but hopefully she can, she can uh, connect and, and take part in the discussion. Um, in, in the meantime, I um, uh, really want to encourage you to, to raise your hand if you, if you want to, to make a, a comment or, uh, or uh, you know, raise a question uh, or, or make any, any point. Uh, you know, we want to uh, have this discussion as interactive as possible for, for the last uh, 30 minutes uh, that we have on, on, on board. Um, so please, please do raise your hand uh, and, and, and come in. Um, I see Thomas uh, from, from Groundwork uh, as his hand up. Um, so uh, Thomas, uh, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Gaylor. Um, so basically, Gaylor, I think um, I've just been going through some of the messages in, in the chat group. And um, there's one interesting message uh, that speaks about the problem of job losses. And it also touches based on the history of mine workers. And I think it's it's very important for, for everyone to note that um, we in, in the current system, not, not only are we experiencing issues within the mining sector, but it's also part of the system that we have inherited where the, the focus was on extractivism and uh, it was labeled cheap because people were being paid slave slave wages. And um, I mean, even if we talk about employment, one of the key questions is how come within the high flight we don't see people getting jobs? How come the level of unemployment is high? Whereas we've got like all the coal fired power plants and all the mines in the area. So it, 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 it goes back to say, uh, we, we honestly need to ask ourselves questions. Does mining create jobs or does it just uh, recycle the workers? One mine, one mine closes and then another one opens and then the same people get, get jobs. Uh, we also need to think about the honest fact that um, we always run away from. Uh, back then we used to say people are not getting jobs because of labor migration. Is that still happening? 
And if it's still happening, how, how do we manage the situation? Because not only does it impact on the opportunities or the potential for people to get jobs, but it also impacts on municipal services because with the influx, then the municipality has to uh, redevelop their infrastructure to cater for the, the number of people um, that are coming in, in into that particular area. So I think for me, it's, it's very important to, for us to be very realistic when it comes to mining to say, yes, we know uh, our economy has been formed at the backdrop of the coal economy, but does the coal economy still serve as a real solution to our problems today, either social or even if we look into energy? Do we still need to rely on the coal economy to solve social issues or our energy issues? And then once we answer that question, then we can begin to deliberate whether a mining job is valuable in the current age or we need to revisit uh, the value of mining. Thanks, Keno. Thanks, Thomas, for, for those points. Um, yeah, really, really useful, again, to take a bit of a historical perspective and understanding, I guess, again, looking at it from an economic, social, and environmental perspective is, is, is fundamental. Um, I see another, and, uh, and, and, and Tobacco, um, yeah, feel free to, to come through. Uh, welcome to put your camera on as well. Um, yeah, over to you. Thank you, Kaylo. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear you long clear? Beautiful. I am Dobeko, uh, based in Cape Town. Uh, I'm from a company called Ben Peter. We are a secular economy business. We do waste diversion from landfill and we also do wastewater recycling. We are also members of African Secular Economy Network. Um, I'm giving that background, um, you know, to show how interested we are in this conversation and uh, the documentary, it's beautifully done, uh, well done to the producers. And uh, I'm happy to see that Andre is still on the line uh, as he was making the keynote address. I've listed, you know, a long list of questions, uh, but I will ask one at a time. And if there is still time for me, I will keep on coming back. Um, the, the, the first one was touched on uh, on the documentary. Komati uh, power station being the first one to be closed down. Uh, I was really worried and concerned about what will happen to that infrastructure. Uh, but the bit I got from the documentary is that there would be the assembly of those um, microgrids uh, to be distributed wherever they are required. Um, for me, that looks, you know, a, a, as a tiny project uh, compared to the vast infrastructure that is there. So the first question is, what else is going to be done with the Komati uh, infrastructure? And secondly, you know, how much would it be to set up this microgrid that can power 25 houses? Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, and Tobacco. I think that's that's great. Um, yeah, we'll just collect a few a few interventions. Uh, I see Maxine. Uh, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Gelo. So um, yeah, just to quickly introduce myself. I'm Maxine Buzainet. Um I currently work at the Alternative Information and Development Center. Um, and focus on the right to say no and dismantle corporate power work. Um, so, I mean, my question is, is I think also um, based off um, one of the comments that were made in the chat about um, um, the need to, to mine um, rare earth minerals and plat platinum group metals um, for renewable energy technology and, and, and sort of the the, the rise of what one can term um, the green extractivism um, economy and 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 the in, what what kind of implications um, that will have um, on, on on communities where those 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 minerals and metals are found um, um, if we're talking about a just transition and, and and sort of a move away it cannot be just a move away um, from from fossil fuel usage 
um, because surely then we are just creating a uh, what you call it the same uh, the same devil with a different face, if you will, um, um, because the the intentions are supposedly um, you know good in the sense that you know we want clean energy and and all of those things. So so for me that's. I mean, I, I I haven't been in 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 much conversations where 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 the real implications of 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 the screen extractivism conversation um, is happening, and 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 I I, I think about um, all, all communities who are resisting um, current mining activity, but. Um, where where are our communities and and workers particularly involved with um, renewable energy in the sense that it is perhaps maybe communally owned and run, um, and 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 what that what that would mean for for the reduction of energy poverty in within communities. Um, um, and should, if, for instance, let me give an example. What if there's um, a community on the platinum belt that um, is refusing to have a mine open for a particular, say, a metal like rhodium or, or whatever, um, and they are resisting the opening of that mine, is the implications thereof then that the community is... Um, withhold or, or not withholding but um delaying the transition um to cleaner energy um you know there's 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 all those types of contradictions that 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 i've been thinking about i don't i don't know if this contribution makes makes any sense but i'm sure um you can take from it um what you will but those are just some thoughts thanks so much thanks so much uh maxine um no and i think you know Interestingly, I think the the different points and and, and questions, you know, um, uh, all seem to converge a little bit. Uh, and I also see some discussion in the chat about, well, what are those opportunities? You know, where are those jobs? That are, uh, where are the jobs that are going to come from? You know, um, if that's not in the coal value chain, um, then you know. Is it going to be in renewable energy? Is it going to be in you know, manufacturing? Is it going to be in in other type of mining? Um, and and those jobs, of course, you know, in some cases would come with some trade offs. Um, and and you know, you pointed out that certainly that of course the transition to a green economy is actually quite you know, mineral intensive in many respects. I think you know, something we have to to reckon with. Um, so. Um, I see one more, one more, and uh, and then I'll I'll uh, end over back to 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 our panelists as well uh, to to Andre uh, if if uh, if he's still here, Andre, um, uh, just for for some reaction as well and, and comments. But first, let's let's take uh, um, Simangani, uh, Simangani, uh, over to you. Um, thanks, moderator. I just want to ask. Um, a few questions. Um, and number one, um, I heard something about the local economic development. And uh, my understanding is that uh, that vehicle must be sitting with the, with the, within the local authority. And perhaps the extent, the question is to what extent uh, the local authorities being involved in, in, in in, in, in the transition process in order to make sure that opportunities are, are not lost in the process. And obviously other key stakeholders like your universities and other suppliers, what are they doing differently to enhance the sustainability of this community? And also maybe, um, in the best interest of time, another question perhaps is the implication of the war between Ukraine and the, uh, Iraq. We have seen some regression um, towards the use of, or maybe going back to the use of coal again. What are the implications? What is the sort of uh, the dashboard looking like? Will this move 
move, go forward as planned, or there'll be some stoppages here and there and try to uh, do a lot in terms of uh, managing, uh, mitigating the risk uh, of uh, using for fossil fuels um, and so on. Thank you. so much uh Sivangani. i think that's uh was useful useful comments as well um just want to give a, an opportunity now maybe back to our, our uh our speakers and panelists uh to to pick on some of those comments and questions um andre are you are you are you with us um yeah if you you can pick up uh there was a direct question of course on, on comati and what's going on at, at the power station um a little bit of that in the documentary but of course uh you can expand a lot more and feel free to, to pick up as well on any of the other points if, if you wish so. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so Kumati is, is, is the very first uh, power station, as I said, that will be shut down from September. And it's also the most advanced in terms of uh, creating a flagship project for the Just Energy Transition project. Uh, we've got a number of plans, um, a 100 megawatt PV plant, um, also a 70 megawatt wind plant, uh, which is in pre-feasibility at this point in time, based on the very promising new wind data that we received. <clears throat> we are also putting up a training center. Now, this is very important. We are working with uh, Saratec, which is the uh, South African Renewable Energy uh, Training and Education Center under the auspices of the Cape University, um, Cape Peninsula University of Technology. And uh, it's a world-class facility. And what we want to do is we want to learn from them uh, how to provide accredited training uh, as wind and PV technicians. We are told by the industry associations that there's a significant need for um, skilled technicians. Uh, and, and, and that's the start of job creation, is to not only repurpose power stations, but also to repurpose people, frankly, to uh, go from um, handling coal shovels to be able to handle wind turbine blades. And that's a, that's a great opportunity. So, so that's part of what we do. We're also setting up a, um, a microgrid manufacturing facility. The question was asked, what does one of these cost? Uh, they cost about 1.5 million Rand. Uh, so it's a, uh, I think it's a real bargain. Um, but the benefit is that, of course, it, it, it uses an old shipping container. So there's, there's also an environmental angle repurposing uh, old shipping containers. And you can put these on the back of a truck and deploy them essentially anywhere in the country or in southern Africa. So we've had a lot of interest from uh, developmental organizations who want to buy these for uh, use to provide electricity to outline clinics and schools and so forth. Uh, and it's an ideal opportunity to provide um, electricity to these um, far-flung regions at a much lower cost than it would take to extend the transmission and distribution grid. Um, we have provided electricity to hundreds of thousands of South Africans. And the last remaining South Africans that uh, now are to be provided with electricity are extremely costly to reach because they're in mountainous and remote areas. So the cost per connection is in the order of about 190,000 Rand. And the electrification process provided by uh, the DMRE provides about 25,000 Rand. So there's a significant shortfall, but we think that um, these microgrids can provide a very good opportunity. So we, we want to um, incubate more of these manufacturing and assembly lines to entrepreneurs who have experience in manufacturing. Uh, we will provide technical support, but, but we are very keen to, to talk to uh, experienced and competent manufacturers who are able to take advantage of this nascent market and to drive that further. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andrew, for yeah for the additional detail. Very, very useful, very comprehensive. And you are correct. I mean, one one point five million rand for for uh, that is is a bargain. Um, so we should really tap into into this opportunity a lot more. 
Um, I see Matthew's got his hand up, so I'll I'll, I'll start with with you, Matthew, and then I'll also then give the floor to to Dudu and, and Rita. Um, but um, yeah, Matthew, go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, I just wanted to emphasize on one thing. I think it um, the issue of um, the issue of paradigm shift, and I also want to relate this to uh, what Andre has shared in terms of uh, the rolling out of the project here in Pumalanga uh, about the solar panels and the containers. The first thing that I want to emphasize is that paradigm shift means that um, we ought to move from the old ways of doing things. In the past and currently, workers are, and communities are excluded in decision-making and workers are coming in um, into the mines and the power stations as employees. And it's up to the management to sort determine when do the contracts come to an end. So if we are to undertake just transition, it means that power relations, uh, the power relations ought to change. Workers and communities must pay, play a pivotal role uh, in determining the future, especially around issues that pertains, you know, especially to just transition. That then takes me to say that um, any renewable energy production or, or implementation of such projects must take into consideration that if we import these solar panels and the wind turbines, we are still, you know, exporting the jobs. So the chances of us creating more jobs in South Africa are very slim because these panels are produced somewhere and they will still have environmental problems and other social challenges. Because the moment you roll out the solar panels, a solar farm will require uh, land. And the massive you know, roll out of such uh, will lead to you know, still the expulsion of our people from the land. And um, it's not different from any monocultural timber plantation or agriculture there's still gonna be some, some imp uh, impact on the you know, um, um, ecosystem, especially the biodiversity, because I doubt if anything will grow underneath those panels. So these are some of the things that we need to say. Um, I would be happy if uh, uh, Andre was saying, ESCOM is actually embarking on a program to ensure that the solar panels are produced locally, that the wind turbines are produced locally, that we are not going to import from China, we are not going to import from uh, uh, Europe, whether Italy or France, but we are going to produce these solar panels here. And therefore, they, we have developed a strategy on how to deal with you know, the lithium batteries after the end of their lifespan. So that is what is important for me. But uh, we should not be happy that uh, there is this project that is being rolled out when these solar panels are coming from outside. We are still in deep. Travel. Thanks. I think you know what, you, what you're pointing out to is, is obviously the need to maximize the opportunities. Um, just on that, there's um, uh, a renewable energy master plan that's being it's being developed uh, under the auspices of the uh, Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, as well as the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition, which is really trying to do that. Actually, trying to leverage you know the renewable energy industry to spur industrial development. Um, so that's currently in the making. At, Quite actually advanced stage. Um, we hope it's going to bear some some important fruit because you are right. You know we we should localize as much as possible uh, when it comes to industrial development and you know uh, when it comes to renewable energy. That's that's certainly something that we we need to do. Um, I want to hand over now to 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 Dudu um, and then to Rita for some some final uh, some final thoughts. Um, Dudu, um, over to you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Kaylo. Um, if you check, basically, I, I think everyone highlights the key issues, but as uh, what we are trying to do as in Bovalanga now, we came up with a just transition landscape that is going to cover the economical effects 
of the just transition that is going to highlight on the economic diversification, growth, descent, and sustainable jobs, local entrepreneurs, and ownership. So we are highlighting those other parts on the side of the economy. At the same time, we are looking at the social effects that is going to cover the labor migration, disturbance of livelihood and quality of life that covers the health aspect and the social protection and the social service delivery and population. Because there are a lot of people that are still moving to Mpumalanga with the opportunity of finding jobs and then in mining sector, and at the same time, whereas there's a decommissioning that is taking place and already other mines are already closed at the moment. So these are the other issues that we are just like handling it that will raise the crime. And after that, those social kind of ills that are gonna be generated through that whole process, we have to cover it on the social uh, aspect. And then after that, we look at the technical and cost effect. We know that immediately when there's a this new technology of renewable energy are coming in. How is it going to impact, especially on the electricity tariffs? And then is it sustainable the grid that we have? Because more than anything, we might say it, but because it's not being done and everybody knows and understand about it. And at the same time, we want to make sure that the mining closure, and, and then if it happens, and the, or as, as it happens, but it should be sort of like not leaving any person behind, making sure that every person is much more involved and their words and their voices are being heard in this sort of like a, a, a landscape that we are designing. And at the same time, the technology that are gonna come in, are they going to be in a good standard? And then who's going to monitor the quality assurance? Cause like it might be booming out on all the areas. At the same time, um, at the previous office, then we'll be looking for the governance side that is going to cover the climate change, the just transition, the collaboration, cooperation, partnership, and partnership, and skill development. Because we know that each and every person comes with a perspective of skill development, but is that skill development going to respond to the situation that we have? At the same time, we look at the urban land uh, use management and planning, workers, and community transition. That is the kind of key I think Matthew has highlighted very well and richer. So these are the issues that it needs to be on the a sort of like democratic governance design framework that will be ensuring that it covers that. At the same time, the public sector performance. Are the municipality performing the way it's supposed to perform? Are they giving it the sort of like a leverage of the land? And at the same time with the current year, waste that has been generated, are we converting it into other sort of like uh, assets that can generate jobs and all these other issues? So with that landscape that we are designing, we'll be looking at all these kind of aspects. At the same time, we'll have the environment uh, effect that we have to reduce the, our emissions and the loss of biodiversity and how can we inculcate that with the tourism that is not, I think currently it, when we check in Gangala, um, the percentage of, of tourism is limited, whereas we can convert some of this uh, infrastructure to create uh, the tourism site and then for that and ensure that the land degradation is being subs sort of like replaced with the nourishing that is going to be last for a long time. So that is actually my comment. But with the green, I think somebody has asked about the Malanga Green Economy Cluster. Actually, when it was initiated, it was initiated to implement the, the green the development plan that is there in Pumalanga. But at the same time, I think Mr. Gonyane highlighted in the documentary that it's going to cover some of other elements of the transitioning part. So somewhere, somehow, we are working closely with them. It's like we have launched the Green uh, Energy Summit. We're talking basically as Pumalanga about it, that we really need to advance and at the same time, we really need to move in a high pace in ensuring that a uh, transition, it becomes the key now in Bumalang, as it's gonna affect us. According to me, I was saying that stop everything South Africa, focus on Bumalang to ensure that we rescue so much job and at the same time, we improve the livelihood of our community. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dudu, uh, for that. Um, Rita, you have the last words. Thank you, Gail. I'll just make a final comment on the coal sector. Uh, we're not saying that coal is the ultimate answer. 
But we do recognize the fact that uh, South Africa is not yet ready to move towards other, uh, to renewables because we do not have the skills yet uh, for our workers to to be to work in that field, and we also do not have our own uh, sets of technologies where we can rely on ourselves as manufacturers of those uh, whatever we're going to need in order to to supply the energy. So we're saying that in the meantime, while we are getting ready, let us still use coal because it is in abundance. And uh, as we add other forms of energy to the mix, then we can, we can reduce on the amount of coal that we need. But we do need to be self-reliant. We do not need to export uh, technologies into our country because that will not help us in, in, in creating jobs. We need to create our own manufacturing uh, in, in South Africa, where we can, for, for, for the purposes of uh, renewables. Thank you, Gail. Thanks, thanks, Rita, uh, for, for those points. Uh, you know, it is a transition. It will take some time. And of course, we have to accelerate uh, in, in doing so, um, but at our own, at our own pace. Um, we are uh, now uh, reaching reaching a, a close uh, for for today's event. I really want to thank you again for for participating and taking part. Uh, I've put the link uh, to the documentary again in the chat. Feel free to share it. Feel free to use it. Um, you know, it's there for you uh, and for everyone to use. Uh, and share with colleagues, uh, you know, uh, friends, uh, and, and, and your networks. Um, I've also put in the chat the links to two reports that we just released uh, this week, uh, looking at the economic diversification of the coal fields uh, on the one end, as well as uh, you know the toolbox for local governments uh, on the other end. Feel free to have a look at those uh, two reports as well. I uh, really want to thank again our, uh, our panelists uh, and our speakers, as well as again all of you for, for joining. Uh, hope you uh, enjoyed the documentary. Uh, it is meant to be a conversation starter. Uh, it doesn't provide the answers. Uh, so please use it to keep the conversation going. Keep in touch with each other. Keep in touch with us. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you uh, again next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.